Well, good morning. Um, I will go ahead and apologize for my southern accent. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to be back in Texas, or to be back, in, not to be back in Texas, to be in Texas. Uh, and every time I open my mouth, people don't say, where are you from? Because in Salt Lake City, we lived there for six years um, serving the North American Mission Board. Every time I'd open my mouth, people would say, well, you're not from here, are you? No, I'm not. Utahns have a very distinct accent. Even in Kentucky, Dr. Kreider can attest to this. Uh, people who are in Louisville and mostly around all of Northern Kentucky uh, don't talk like I do, uh, nor does Dr. Kreider talk like I do. My Ohio State brother over here, he and I have a good time about football. Uh, but we're not here to talk about the South or to talk about football. We're here to answer a very simple, or what seems like it should be a simple question to answer, and that is, is beauty really in the eye of the beholder? So in her 1878 book entitled Molly Bond, Irish novelist Margaret Wolfe Hungerford included a single phrase inside of a section of dialogue. This dialogue is just between two characters, and that single phrase has been used time and again in literature, in social media, in academic debate, in theological discussion. And the phrase is at the same time and in the same way completely insignificant and hugely significant. Right, So it's insignificant yet significant at the same time. And what's fascinating is, is within the overall context of this book of Molly Bond, the phrase is just another line of dialogue. It doesn't really add anything to the book. It doesn't really subtract anything. You could almost remove the phrase from the book and it wouldn't really make a difference. But in the overall context of the cultural adaptation of the phrase, overstating its significance would be close to impossible because this phrase that she includes in her 1878 book is as close to a definition of our culture as you'll find anywhere. It defines our politics, it defines our music, it defines our ethics, it defines our identity, it defines our very culture, and it defines our self-worth our ego, our individuality, it even defines our clothing choices. And the phrase is only eight words, and it seems so innocent. But the evil that has come from this line of thought cannot be enumerated. And the simple but profound, thoughtless yet thought-provoking, beautiful yet evil phrase found in the book is this. Here are the eight words. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's it. And we might go as far as to say that no phrase has so encapsulated generations of thought as that one phrase has. Now again, though Hungerford was surely not the first to make a statement similar to this, she was the first to phrase it in that particular way. So even though that phrase has really defined our culture for a number of generations, it's only about 130 to 140 years old. So what do we make of this? Because when, when she says in the book, or when the characters say in the book, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the basic claim they're making is that beauty is ever changing. And you could even go as far as to infer that truth is ever changing and standards are ever changing, that there really is no such thing as objectivity. It reminds me of a, a philosophical illustration that's used a pretty good bit to, to describe the difference in between pre-modern, modern, and post-modern eras. Pre-modern, and it's used, uh, the, uh, the analogy is, is used in terms of baseball. So there's a pre-modern umpire, there's a modern umpire, and there's a post-modern umpire. The pre-modern umpire says there are balls and strikes and I call them as they are. The modern umpire says there are balls and strikes and I call them as I see them. The post-modern umpire says there are neither balls nor strikes until I call them. <laughs> right, so the pre-modern umpire is not involved in it at all. He sees an objective reality with regard to balls and strikes. The modern umpire says, well, I'm inserting myself into this a little bit. The postmodern umpire says, it's nothing until I say it's something. And that's, I would argue, exactly what this statement is doing. It's trying to make the claim that for beauty, and then again by extension truth and objectivity, that it's not really universal, that it's something that's very subjective. So what do we make of this? Is beauty ever changing? Well, 
I'm going to say this from the outset. I'm going to say some things you're going to disagree with. And that's okay. You're welcome to be wrong. <laughs> oh, seriously, all kidding aside, I'll say some things I'm, that you're going to disagree with, but keep in mind that you need to follow the entire argument before you start going, I'm going to throw rocks at him and burn him at the stake. All right? So here's the first thing I'm going to say that's probably going to make you disagree with me. Is beauty ever changing? Taken on face value, we must at least to some degree agree with the statement that beauty is ever changing. Because if the statement were not true, why would one human being say to another, this music is beautiful? While the person who hears that, thinking the first has lost his mind, say, this is the worst thing my ears have ever heard. Just as an example, I don't like rap music. I, I just, hear, hear. I, hear, hear. I just don't like it. <clears throat> I, I, it just doesn't comport with my brain. And I had plenty of students at Southern, and we had church planters in Salt Lake City who love rap music, especially Christian rap. In fact, I had students at Southern who are now involved in Christian rap scene. Dr. Kreider knows some of those. And they would say, man, isn't this music just so wonderful? And my response is always, no, it's horrible. Well, what, what do we make of beauty when we talk about that? If the statement beauty is ever changing or is beauty ever changing, if it's not true, then why would one human say this clothing is beautiful while another seeing the same clothing and being repulsed says that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life? I think that anytime I see news coverage of fashion shows in Paris, especially over the last... 30 to 40 years. The stuff's just ugly. But people in Paris think this is the most gorgeous thing my eyes have ever seen. And I think they are crazy. They think I'm crazy. I think that uh, sometimes my wife is involved in selling items on a website called Poshmark. And she'll show me sometimes these things like she'll show me, hey, look at this purse right here on Poshmark. The original list price on this purse is $2,500. And my first question is, why? It's a piece of fabric with a couple of straps. I can make that for 10 bucks or less. Well, it's got somebody's name on it, is the response. And my immediate response back is, I don't care. But people are willing to pay that kind of money because they think it's beautiful because of a name that's attached to it. So how could they think it's beautiful? Well, I think it's completely repulsive. If the statement is not true, why would one human say the Christian religion is beautiful? while another seeing the same faith tradition say Christian religion is ugly. How could one person say Christianity is true and another say it's completely false or it's beautiful but not? Now, if you're listening closely, you'll notice I just made a leap in comparisons. I went from music to clothing to religion. And we sometimes think those things should be in different categories. And we could easily argue that, a, that Christianity is ugly to a non-Christian because of the effects of the fall, but should we include such things as music and clothing in the same category as religion? And what I'm going to argue today is that we indeed not only can, but that we should and we must include all of those categories in the same category as religion. And what I want to do is I want to base my argument on the text of Scripture. I am, any of my students who have ever had me, either at Southern or here, will tell you that I'm a book, chapter, and verse kind of guy. Don't tell me biblically speaking. Don't say those words and then have something come out of your mouth. Because that doesn't mean anything. I want book, chapter, verse to show me why you believe something is the case or that you're inferring something is the case. So you're going to either need an electronic copy or a physical copy of a Bible in front of you if you're going to follow the argument today because we're going to be in the text a lot. So now let's move our proverbial ball down the field a bit. As Christians, we have to ask ourselves, not just as humans, but as Christians, we have to ask ourselves, is beauty really in the eye of the beholder or is there more to the story than understanding aesthetics in terms of personal preference? Now, again, as I mentioned, I'm going to argue that there is more to the story than just personal preference. But at the same time, I'm going to argue that aesthetic choices are personal preference. So they're not, and they are. 
Something can be both beautiful and ugly to different people because it all depends on how you define beauty. Another way to put that is one of my favorite movies says, normal all depends on where you're standing. Another has argued that normal is what your friends will let you get away with, right? So let's turn to the text, see if we can answer the question, is beauty really in the eye of the beholder? And here's the thesis that I want to kind of work on today. Beauty is, not is not, but is indeed in the eye of the beholder. However, a claim of whether or not something is truly beautiful depends wholly and completely on one's state of regeneration and how one defines beauty. And the definition of beauty is also based on a person's state of regeneration. So in order to get a biblical picture of how this works, we have to start in the best place to start. Where is, let me ask you, where's the best place to start? Genesis, because it's the beginning, right? So we start in Genesis 1 and 2, and we start specifically with the nature of man as defined in Genesis 1 and 2. And we see in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis that man is created in God's image, right? That's not a trick question. That's not a trick statement. Man is created in God's image. And what we see in creation, if you'll allow me to use the board here because I like to write things on the board, what we see is there's not only man created in God's image, but there's an order set to creation, right? And here's the order that's set. It's set in this way. God creates humans. Humans are meant originally to be the vice regent, as a friend of mine at Southern Seminary says, or the direct representative of God on the earth. There is inside this line of humanity an order set between man and woman. And then at the bottom, he creates animals. So God rules over humans inside of the order of humanity. Uh, men are set. Don't hear me being, you know, caveman-ish. I'm not dragging my wife across the floor by her hair or anything and not arguing she's supposed to be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. That's not what I'm saying, all right? But there is, biblically, there is an order set between men and women, and then man and woman together are to rule over creation, to rule over the animals, all right? That's just a simple summary of Genesis 1 and 2. But then comes Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, we see that the order that's set in creation is completely overturned. And so are the definitions set in Genesis 1 and 2. So what happens in Genesis 1 and 2, again, is God to humans, man to woman, and then humans rule over the animals. In Genesis 3, what happens? Who is the tempter? The serpent, an animal, goes to whom first? to Eve first, who then does what? Goes to her husband, who then when God says, what have you done? What does he say? The woman you gave to me. The woman you gave to me, it's her fault, which by indirect analogy means it's your fault, mm -hmm. God. So the man blames it all on somebody else. So you have God, man, woman, creation, and the whole thing in Genesis 3 gets turned completely upside down. So all of creation is completely upset. So what we can say then is in Genesis 1 and 2, when things are going in the correct way, beauty is defined by what God says is beautiful. Truth is defined by what God says is truth. It doesn't change. It is what it is. In, so again, this is Genesis 1 and 2. In Genesis 3, the whole thing gets turned upside down. Philosophically, we might say it's a top-down Platonic way over here, and it's a bottom-up Aristotelian way over here. So you could even put that into religion, and you can say it's a Protestant way on this side, and it's a Roman Catholic way on this side, because Protestantism is top-down and Roman Catholicism is bottom-up, right? So what happens over here is, on this side, truth and beauty are defined by what God says. On this side, because it's top down, on this side, it's defined by what creation says. So the whole thing gets completely turned upside down. Now, even on the Genesis 3 side, we can still say that beauty is defined by God's standards. However, our willingness to accept those definitions 
has been completely overrun and has been undercut by the fall. How do we fix that undercutting? The only way to fix that is not through education. The way that's fixed is only by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. That's it. So, again, we know from Genesis 1 and 2, man is created in God's image. So we know that there is some type of image of God in us just by virtue of creation. We also know from Jeremiah 31, 33, that God has written his law into our hearts. We know what is right. We know what is good. We know what is beautiful. We're just not willing to accept it. In his Institutes of the Christian Religion, reformer John Calvin calls this the census divinitatis, that every person everywhere in the history of human civilization, so every person who has, does, and will ever live, always look for something bigger. I just finished at 945 this morning, I just finished a course in world religions. We were talking about animism in South Africa, among the Zulu people in South Africa. Those people are looking for something bigger than themselves when they look towards the ancestors when they look towards the God of the sky, when they look to the heaven herd to move weather around in certain patterns. They're looking for something bigger. And what Calvin argues, and what I would say Genesis and Jeremiah are arguing, is that that's the image of God in them coming out, but they're twisting it and marring it because of Genesis 3. Now, here's what's interesting. When we combine Genesis 1 and 2 with Jeremiah 31, and we put that together with Romans 1, now we have a fuller picture of what's happening. So let's look... First text we'll actually look at is Romans 1. We're going to look at verses 18 through 25. It's Romans 1, 18 through 25. And we're going to read that together. Paul says, For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Okay, when you suppress something, that means it's there. You're just pushing it down. Right? So the image of God in man is not completely gone. Genesis 3 does not make man completely and totally evil. Because I would argue, as Augustine does, that for something to be completely and totally 100% evil, it would not exist. So he says, Paul says, they suppress the truth. Verse 19, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, that is, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what has been made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. So what we see in this passage is that man, rather than worshiping, following, obeying God's standards, understanding God's definitions of truth and beauty and goodness, that man creates idols from created things and worships and follows and obeys the things he's just created, which I think all of us would argue is the very definition of insanity. You see that my favorite passage discussing this is Isaiah 44. If you read Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 20, you see a man cuts down a tree and he cuts some logs out of that tree. And with one of the logs, he creates a fire and he warms himself. And over that same fire, he bakes bread and he eats and he feels satisfied from the bread. And out of that same log that he's just cut down and used to make fire and used to bake bread, he forms an idol out of it. And what does he do? He worships it. And he said, it's not I that have made you, but you have made me. That's proof to me that God has a sense of humor. Because you read that passage and you think this really is complete insanity. Isaiah 44, the same thing as you see in Jeremiah chapter 10. It's this idea of idolatry, Jeremiah 10, 14, and 15, if you want to look that up later. It's this idea of idolatry, and what it is, is it's this in action. It's the idea of man taking control of creation in all the ways that God said not to do. To add to it, to add to our problems here, likewise, you see this in Ephesians chapter 4. So flip over a few books to Ephesians 4. We're going to look at verses 17 through 19. 
Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. So Paul says, Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. Now, when he says gave themselves over to promiscuity, don't just think sexual promiscuity. Think religious adultery as well. Think idolatry. These Gentiles, these unbelievers, Paul says, have given themselves over. Why have they done that? Doesn't Genesis 1 and 2, doesn't Jeremiah 31 say the image of God is in them? Why in the world would they give themselves over? Because of this. Right? So how do we escape this? How do we escape this complete, unadulterated self-intoxication with ourselves? Well, we just need to read the the newest self-help book. Or we need the priestess of America from years past, Oprah Winfrey, to help us escape our thoughts. We need pop psychologist Jordan Peterson to help us get past this. Maybe if I drink enough, I'll just forget. Maybe if I take enough marijuana because I've been in the Denver airport for too long on a layover, maybe that will help me. Maybe if I find enough sexual partners, that will help me escape all this stuff. Maybe if I get involved in sports, maybe that will help me escape. None of those things will do it. All right, my favorite testimony about this kind of thing is from Deion Sanders, who was a very wealthy and very well-known football player and baseball player. And in his personal testimony after conversion, he says, guess what? Prior to conversion, I had all the money. I had all the fame. I had all the power. I had all the women. I had everything I wanted. And then I heard the gospel. And I realized I had a cross-sized hole in my heart. And he says, after conversion, I no longer cared about any of that stuff, and I only wanted Christ. So how do we escape this? The Bible is very clear and presents only one way to escape, and that is through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit wrought through the verbal proclamation of the gospel. People are not saved. I want you to listen to me and listen to me well right here. This is more important than talking about beauty. People are not saved by how you live your life. People are saved by your verbal proclamation of the gospel message of Jesus. Period. End of story. You cannot put enough roofs on houses in southern Louisiana that were just destroyed by the hurricane and somebody go, oh, yep, Jesus. It takes the verbal proclamation of God's word. In fact, turn back over to Romans and let's look at chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. I promise this is coming around to beauty. This is just a foundation. Look at Romans 10, verses 8 through 13. Paul says, on the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. Notice there that the entire human person is involved in salvation. It's the heart, which is the inner being, and it's the mouth, which is the outer being. And Paul says a little bit later in the New Testament, what is in the heart proceeds from the mouth. So he says in verse 11, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Post-regeneration man, though not perfected, is fundamentally changed from self-centered pre-regeneration man. He's changed from self-centered to God-centered He has his priorities completely changed. He also has his desires changed. This is where we're going to start to hit on the idea of beauty. Look at 1 Corinthians 10, 31. One of my favorite passages to reference. Because when I was a professor at Southern, I was a professor of Christian worldview and apologetics. Christian, the the worldview is the idea, most of you probably, this won't be new information, but a worldview is the idea that when you 
put on a new faith or you take on a new way to see things. It's like a pair of glasses. Without these glasses, I'm completely blind. I can see that there are colored spots in the room, but I can't tell who you are. I don't know who this is. I don't know who that is. I can't read words on the screen. I can't read that. When I put these on, it completely changes my world. All right, I can see I've got a padre in the room because you've got on a San Francisco Padres hat, right? A uh, Giants hat, sorry. San Diego would be the Padres. See, my eyes are still messing me up. I can read this. I can tell who all of you people are. 1 Corinthians 10.31 is the worldview verse. Look at it. So whether you eat or drink, and we won't even talk about food choices for Christians, whether you eat or drink, because that's, that's something I can just stay on all day, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, boy, that phrase will get you every time. Whatever you do, do some things. Is that what it says? What does it say? All things, everything. For what purpose? The glory of God. So my grandmother, when she was uh, still alive, when I was a little kid, I would go to her house every, every day in the summer while my mom was working, dad was working. So my grandmother basically raised me right, right near Bob Jones in my hometown. And uh, she would often say this to me. She would say, honey, don't make Jesus embarrassed when he comes back to come and get you by where you are, by what you're doing, or by what you're saying. That's 1 Corinthians 10.31. If I'm in the midst of some action or in the midst of some place or in the midst of saying something and Jesus were to return at that moment, would it be embarrassing to him to have to come and get me in that circumstance? Would he come to me and say, I can't believe I died for this? Now, yes, it's bad theologically, but you get the point, right? So with this post-regeneration change, with 1 Corinthians 10.31 as our new disposition our disposition toward things not glorifying God also changes. So if you look at, back to Romans again, if you look at Romans 8, 23, Paul says, not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now, this passage tells us that we're to wait with eager anticipation for the time of the consummation of all things. But we can, I would argue, infer from this passage that any time we experience non-Christian creativity, we should long for and desperately desire that that creativity be used for the kingdom of God and not for Satan. Because anytime we see, I will argue, anytime we see or experience a non-Christian creating something and calling it beautiful, that talent is a gift from God. But the human is suppressing it, is suppressing the truth of that gift and using it to worship creation rather than creator. For example, I probably should not admit this in public. Dr. Haniel will think less of me as soon as I say this. Dr. Kreider probably already knows this and thinks less of me anyway. But I have two absolute favorite non-Christian musicians. I've seen them both in concert more than 10 times each. Anytime they're within driving distance, I go. In fact, we left Salt Lake City in the summer of 2017 to drive to L.A. just to see one of these in concert, about an eight-hour drive. And that's Billy Joel. Some of you are like, yes. In fact, when Billy Joel was in Arlington back last year, Dr. Shirley over in the Terry School and I found out we were at the same concert at the same time together. Dr. Shirley is also a Billy Joel fan. My other one, Billy Joel can be a little bit, you know, on the lighter side of things. A friend of mine at Southern says, Barry Jocelyn, says that Billy Joel is slowly rocking America to sleep. <laughs> My other favorite non-Christian musician or favorite non-Christian group doesn't do that. It's a Canadian rock band named Rush. Now, when I hear Billy Joel, right, and my Metallica friend in the back is going, yes, right? When I hear Billy Joel or I hear Rush, I am drawn in because of the complex lyrics and the complex music and the, just the sheer talent of those four men, three in Rush, one for Billy Joel, 
and I can at least in some sense or in one sense enjoy the talents given to them by God even though they don't see them in that way. However, at the same time, my heart breaks because they're not using those talents for the sake of God's kingdom. And I'm a black and white kind of guy. If they're not using them for God, they're using them for Satan. But I just dream of the incredible talent and music that both could create for the sake of drawing people towards the cross. But their music is a cementing in my mind of the argument Paul makes in Romans 1. Both Billy Joel and Rush and any others who create something not for the glory of God are worshiping the creation rather than the creator and thereby breaking the express command of Scripture to worship the Holy One of Israel. They are, even in the creation of their music, showing a talent given to them by their creator, but in active sin at the same time. So, all that as a foundation to ask this. In light of what we've seen in Scripture, let's answer the original question, is beauty really in the eye of the beholder? Yes. Now, don't throw rocks at me yet. Allow me to explain. For the unbeliever, beauty is defined by the unbeliever's lack of regeneration, by the unbeliever's lack of acknowledging his creator. For the unbeliever, whatever feels good, whatever sounds good, whatever looks good is, for him, beautiful. You might take the old Nike slogan, just do it. That's beautiful for the unbeliever. We might even phrase this differently and to say this way, to say that whatever is glorifying to the human is beautiful to the unbeliever. Ultimately, though, whatever is defined as beautiful because it's glorifying to humans and not glorifying to God is actually ugly, not beautiful. For the believer, beauty is defined by the believer's state of regeneration. Whatever God says feels good, sounds good, looks good is beautiful. So we might phrase that differently as well to say that whatever is glorifying to God is beautiful. And ultimately, that is the only true source of beauty. Defining what is truly glorifying to God and what is not is where Christians, though, have some honest points of disagreement. So Christians can disagree. Is this music? Is this art? Is this whatever glorifying to God or is it not? That's where we can disagree. And we have to be very careful there not to elevate points of preference to points of fellowship or even to points of heaven or hell. Now, I say that coming from an apologist perspective. In apologetics, historically, there are apologists who have disagreed on apologetic methodology to the point that each apologist that disagreed with the other went to their denominational ordination council and said, defrock him because he's not a believer. Now, that's just dumb. And that's the technical term for you for saying that. These are not points of heaven or hell. We all want to glorify God. Now, I might say, I just don't see how rap can do so because I don't like it. I don't understand it. But there are students that I had in the past who can create Christian rap. And I know there's disagreement among the faculty on this that can create Christian rap and draw people to Christ in ways that Bill Gaither can't. I'm not sure Bill Gaither could anyway. I'm just kidding. (laughs) He and his homecoming friends. Here's what we can say. We can say with biblical certainty that the concept of beauty itself is defined by God. So really only those things that are glorifying to God are beautiful and only those things should be rightly called beautiful. However, we've seen through the text of Scripture that guess what? The unbeliever is not going to agree with that. The unbeliever will not accept that definition because we base our definition on our Christian worldview and the unbeliever bases his definition on his non-Christian worldview. Now, that does not mean that both are right, right? Ultimately, we have to say and we have to argue very vehemently with everything in us 
that God's definition is the only true definition. Because the unbeliever says so does not make it right. Right? As John MacArthur so well said on Larry King a number of years ago, they were talking about Saddam Hussein and praying. And Larry King said, uh, Dr. MacArthur, Saddam Hussein says he prays. You believe he's praying to anything? And MacArthur just boldly says, well, he's praying to the wrong thing. He's not praying to the God of the scriptures, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's praying to a false God. Larry King, without skipping a beat, says, well, now, Dr. MacArthur, he believes he prays. He believes that he's right. And MacArthur, without skipping a beat, then gives the line of the night, which is Saddam Hussein can believe he can fly and jump off a building and the concrete will meet him quickly. Just because you believe something doesn't make it right. If your beliefs are in conformity with the Word of God, then they're right. It makes me crazy to hear, especially Southern Baptists say, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. I could care less if you believe it. That doesn't settle anything. I do care because I want you to be a believer, right? But the Bible says it, and that settles it. When you say the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it, you're the modern umpire. So in an evangelistic encounter, in an encounter with an unbeliever, when beauty comes up, we have to say that God is the standard of true, objective, universal values and beauty. But again, the unbeliever won't accept that. That doesn't mean you come up with some grand philosophical explanation and expect your, your roaring logic in your brain, your, your once-in-a-generation logic to convince the person of belief, because guess what? That's not going to happen. Your eight-pound gray matter in your skull is not more powerful than the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, and it never will be. The same power in the words of the gospel is found in the words, let there be light, and the sun flipped on. The same power in let there be mountains and the Rocky Mountains popped up and the Alps popped up is found in Romans 3.23, 6.23, 5.8, 10, 9, and 10. The same regenerating power. And only by doing those things and only by proclaiming that gospel will the unbeliever go from I am beautiful to God is beautiful. And only then will he understand what beauty really is. So we can, alongside Paul in Acts 17 at the Areopagus, boldly proclaim to the unbeliever that what he calls beautiful in ignorance, this we proclaim in truth. God is our standard, and he is the source and standard of all things, including beauty. So although, to wrap this up, beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, it is all based on worldview. It's all based on one state of regeneration. And ultimately, things that are truly beautiful are those things which parallel the standard found in 1 Corinthians 10.31, those things which glorify Christ. You know, I often, uh, as I'm driving home in the afternoons and look to the west, see a sunset, as I'm coming up in the mornings, or as I'm out riding my bike, I see a sunrise, or you see my son is into birds. He sees certain birds, or I see them. Uh, you see things in nature, and you think, man, that's just beautiful. How could anybody not believe in God? Those of you in the room who have children, when our son was first born, I held him for the first time. My first thought was not, look at what I've created. My first thought was, how could you not believe in God? as I'm holding him. I think that about sunrises and sunsets, but unbelievers don't think that, do they? They think, look at what I've done. The truth of God in them is screaming. Look at the beauty I have made. It's almost like Tom Hanks from, when, uh, from Castaway. I've made fire. Look at what I've done. I've made fire. That's the way the unbeliever is thinking. But as we consider what's beautiful... Maybe we should consider declaring something with an old hymn writer named Maltby Babcock, who wrote these words. This is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought 
of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. And then this final verse, this is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Is beauty really in the eye of the beholder? Yeah, it is. And it all depends on whether or not the beholder is a Christian or non-Christian. But ultimately, we have to say, though beauty is defined by the person, beauty ultimately is defined by the person's relationship with Christ because Christ is the standard of beauty that we have. So with that, I'll take any questions that you might have for the next six or seven minutes or so. We have one here online. Okay. Um, you allow for the idea that the secular artist might demonstrate the Imago Dei and therefore glorify God. So is it, is it just the intent and the spiritual condition of the artist or Yeah, so I think, again, kind of going back to what I said about talent, I think those talents are given, they're gifts from God. So that it's not just intention. There is in everything, including, and this is a whole other conversation, even including the devil himself, some sort of glorification of God. Because even the devil himself is not out from under the control of God. So when Satan does what he does, like in the book of Job, in the book of Exodus, on and on it goes, Satan is conformed by necessity to God's will. And we know that God's will is good. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So even if in some weird, twisted way, Satan himself has some ounce of goodness and the ability to glorify God, then I would also argue for this question online that even creation of unbelievers, the musical, artistic, whatever it may be, creation of an unbeliever, though it's not meant to glorify God, does glorify God, though the unbeliever doesn't realize it, it doesn't mean it to be that way. Now, would I argue that we should use unbelievers' creation in, in a worship setting? No. In fact, we had a church plant in Salt Lake City that one Valentine's Day, Sunday before Valentine's, you guys are going to love this, <laughs> used a song from the secular artist Pink as a congregational worship song. <laughs> oh, it gets better. And in the song were references to sexual relationships, not in a song of songs kind of way. So here I am with my nine-year-old son, worried about what he's hearing in church. And I went to the planter after the service and I said, if you ever do that again, no Southern Baptist anywhere on the planet will fund what you are doing. Because I was the lead missiologist for the area. He never did it again. And then I found out that they were planning to do it again and I pulled his funding. So should we use those things in, in worship settings? Absolutely, 1,000 times, no. But at least in some way, we have to say that all things that are true come from God. Even things that Satan says are true have to come from God because all truth is God's truth. So though the unbeliever may not mean it to glorify God, he may not use his talents to glorify God, even the very ability of creation, which is one of the ways that we're made in God's image, in and of itself, just as humans through common grace, glorifies God. So it's both glorifying in one sense and sinful in another sense, if that makes sense. Anybody else? This is an easy group. So on that note of um, the secular music, you talked about how you enjoy Billy Joel and Rush. So mm -hmm. even though they are not putting it out with the intention of glorifying God, 
can you, you you're still able to enjoy it in a God honoring and glorifying way? So that's where I, it depends on the day you ask me, honestly. <laughs> if I'm sitting at a concert, yeah, rock on, right? Most days, and I was going to mention this, but I decided not to. Most days when I look at that, I have to say to myself, or I have to ask myself, can a Christian enjoy non-Christian creations for the sake of glorifying God? Now, I would argue we actually have three scriptural examples, from two from Paul and one from Jude, of non-Christian sources being used for the sake of explaining the gospel. Because Paul quotes two very non-Christian poets, and Jude quotes the Apocrypha. Direct quotes. And they're included in the text of the New Testament. Does that mean I'm going to go to the bar and get drunk so I can witness to the drunkard? No, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that I've had conversations with people at Billy Joel concerts and at Rush concerts about Billy Joel and Rush that I could have never had otherwise? Yeah, it does. Does that mean I should subject myself to everything? No. What I'm going to argue is that's an issue of Christian liberty. But again, it depends on the day you ask me. So some days I say, I listen to Billy Joel and I'm in active sin by doing so. And I need to repent and ask for God's forgiveness and listen to things that comport to 1 Corinthians 10.31. Other days I think, calm down a little bit, that's still in some way, shape, or form glorifying God because you're enjoying their talents. Now, if, if I'm listening to, I mean, there are plenty of Billy Joel songs and Rush songs for that matter, not as many because they're not interested in this as much, but there are Billy Joel songs about human sexuality that extol non-marital human sexual relationships. That's not good. And it's not good for a Christian to listen to those things because what goes in the ears will come out of the mouth and it will impact and infect the heart. So, again, it just depends on the day you ask me. I know that's not the answer you want, but it really depends. I'm just being honest. It depends on the day you ask me. Yep. I saw a hand, I think. Yep. Um, I don't know if uh, you listen to Peter Anderson. Um, mm -mm. Oh, yeah. Andrew Peterson. Yeah, yeah, Andrew Peterson. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at Christian missions around the world and the vast majority of the way that the gospel is presented around the world is through Bible story. The Bible is, I don't mean this to say fiction. I mean it to say just generally speaking, literature wise is a big story. So, yeah, I mean, you look at uh, analogous stories like the Pilgrim's Progress. My word, what an incredible adaptation of the gospel that's got gospel truth just oozing out of every pore. You see it in the Chronicles of Narnia. You see it even though Tolkien didn't mean this. You see it in, uh, in the Lord of the Rings series. And In fact, Tolkien expressly says, I don't mean that. But you still can see aspects of it. Uh, you see his worldview coming through. So you see it all throughout, uh, all throughout Christian history that stories have the ability to show beauty and truth. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so this is from an apologist perspective. I'm going to say yes. Again, because I think we see that in three specific places in the New Testament. But what we have to do is we have to not not miss the tree or not miss the forest for the trees. If I get into a conversation about castaway, I want to use that for the sake of the gospel. Because, again, I see Paul doing that on Act, in the Areopagus in Acts 17. What you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you in truth. That sort of thing. So it might be 10, 15, 20 seconds out of a 20-minute conversation. We have to know secular culture. We have to. That doesn't mean you subject yourself to everything in it. But I think the Bible's fairly clear, both 
in text and an example that especially in the New Testament, Paul as the foremost example is very familiar with secular things going on around him. In fact, and this, I know we're out of time. This is the last thing I'll say. In Acts 17, his sermon at the Areopagus, um, he's, he's got Stoics and Epicurean philosophers there with him. He's got followers of Greek and Roman religion there with him. He's got some atheists and he's probably got some Jews. Every single phrase he utters in, at the Areopagus in Acts 17 directly addresses one, two, three, four, five, or all six of those religious traditions. Nothing he says is just for kicks and giggles. Every single thing he says is a direct punch at one of those things. So that's how we do apologetics here. Why do I study Mormonism? Why have I done that for 25 years? So that when I witness to a Mormon, I'll know what he believes in my head and know how to adapt my gospel presentation for him to hear exactly what he needs to hear. Yeah. All right, we're out of time. So Dr. Aniel, it's all yours. Exactly.